Hello, my name is Alex Benitez, and I'm the director of Mount Royal Archaeological Park. Welcome to one of the Southeast's most important Native American cultural heritage sites. Now known as Moundville, the ancient city behind me was once a major Mississippian cultural metropolis. At its height around 800 years ago, the city had more than two dozen platform mounds of various heights surrounding this vast open area that we call a plaza. On top of the mounds and in the plaza, hundreds of structures were built as residences, work areas, play areas, craft working spaces, and places for performing important rituals and politics. Everyday life for thousands of Mississippian Malibu residents occurred right here. But archeologists also believe that much of this everyday life supported a grander goal. Malva was a special place. It was a connection to the afterlife, a portal to the next world. Today we preserve and celebrate the city's past and its importance to many Native American people who consider Malville a homeland. Historically, central Alabama was home to Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Cherokee peoples. Many tribal members return to Malville every year on special visits and during our fall celebration of Southeastern Native American cultures. Today, Moundville is protected as part of Moundville Archaeological Park, a unit of the University of Alabama Museums. It has been designated a National Historic Landmark, and it is also listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Established in the 1930s as Mound State Monument, with the aid of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the park opened its original museum to the public in 1939. Over the past 80 years, much has changed in the park, but the mounds and interest in Mississippian past remain. This video is sponsored by Publix. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Moundville Native American Festival. My name is Lindsay Gordon, and I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator here at the park. And thank you for joining us. Today, our special guest is Alex Alvarez. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so glad to be here. We're while we're broadcasting, feel free to ask us questions in the comments. And as a reminder, this is all live, so if anything can happen. So hang in there with us in case we have any issues. So, Alex, I'm going to toss it over to you because I know you're over there cooking up something great. <laughs> all right. My name is Lindsay. Alex Alvarez. I'm going to get away. 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 Hello, everyone. I'm uh, really honored to, to show you a little bit today of uh, what traditional foods uh, look like here in, here in the state of Alabama uh, several hundred years ago um, and to let you know that they're still going on today. Uh, today I've uh, made some what's called ozofki or softki. Um, it's a very important dish to uh, to uh, uh, Muscogee people but also you know the the other southeastern tribes have different names for it but the main ingredient is something called flint corn and if before uh, you know, Europeans brought wheat. The corn uh, was was the only grain uh, that was used. Well, one of the only grains that was used predominantly used uh, here in the southeast United States. And um, this corn could be processed in many, many different ways, all the way from whole kernels uh, to bust it up using a like a it's called a gijel and gijel and gijubi, which is like a modern day mortar and pestle. Just a and then all the way to a fine dust for a flour to make taklegi or bread um, or a little bit kind of like a grit substance um, to, and, then, and then parched. That was called a, a busky. But uh, today we're talking specifically about ozofki and uh, I'll turn my mic around and show you what flint corn looks like. All right, Alex. Hey. Um, um, oh, there it is. Okay, so this is what flint corn looks like. Um, it's a it's a white corn. Um, this one has already been broken, and uh, so it's, it's you once it's broken, you would sift it in a series of uh, some of our baskets to kind of get the the broken holes off the little you know hard paper that kind of covers each kernel, and uh, this is what you would be left with. So basically, Ozofki is uh, just a few really simple ingredients. It's flint corn, uh, lye, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and then water. And I put on the recipe, um, you know, that you can salt it or sugar uh, sugar to, to taste. But, you know, a lot of their hardcore creeks, you know, we, we, don't, we don't really add anything into it. 
Um, but this, this, this is, it's a very, very simple thing, but um, used to feed a lot of mouth. Uh, in fact, there was a, a cornfield that some of the first uh, English m uh, measured in, uh, in what is present day Georgia. And to, to, in order to support a tribal town or a series of tribal town families, there was a, a corn crop that was 25 by 25 square miles. And that's a lot of food. And so that's what it took to sustain because the people here in the Southeast, you know, they weren't just surviving, living hand to mouth. They were, they were thriving. You know, there was art, there was music, there was language, there was song and dance. And they were, uh, they lived life in such a celebratory way that, you know, there, there was a time for the, for those extra things that make uh, culture beautiful. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we think of, we throw around words like Mesoamerica or paleo Indian, um, you kind of think of like a typical hunter gatherer type, um, uh, uh, stereotype where it's, you know, you got a guy just kind of want to roam around the forest, sticking anything in their mouth to survive. And that wasn't the case. And, you know, of course we weren't nomads. Um, they lived in the same, the same villages for hundreds of years, knew how to do rotate crops and taught that to the first Europeans, uh, to, to come into the Southern colonies. So. As I said, in, uh, in Muscogee language, we call uh, corn Aji. And um, this will be called Aji Gatska, which is like broken corn. Um, and so this, you know, it's a really, really hard, it's almost, almost looks like, uh, like gravel, it's so hard. But um, this can be cooked down, you know, like I said, a, a, a lot of different ways. What happens is, is when you, uh, now, of course, I, today I kind of cheated a little bit. Normally we would cook over an open fire. And uh, today, we, because it's virtual stuff and it's dark outside already because it's getting late in the year, um, we decided to just do this little demo in the inside. But this here is the other ingredient, and it's called gubby jeffy or lye. You can see it's it's almost it's very very clear. So the way you make this is with um, by by uh, burning. Uh, any kind of oak tree, but if you if you burn up what's called blackjack or a red oak, I think is the common name for it. Um, it produces a really really strong uh, strong lye, and so gubbyjuffki literally means a uh, lye drip because <clears throat> after you after those ashes cool down, you have a kind of two containers, and uh, you know, for the first container's got holes, and then we we even use like a, a cheesecloth to strain it even more. And then we pour boiling water on top of those ashes. And then as that water uh, drips down, it collects. And then after the sediment settles down, it looks like this. Now, this is not the chemical lye that, uh, you know, you put in like plumbing and, you know, all kind of other chemical stuff. But this is, you know, natural. And the, the W. Jeffkey was, was used in a lot of different ingredients. And... You know, now there's a lot of research and data coming out, and it's saying that these ingredients were, you know, what kept a lot of the uh, the natives healthy for a long time. There's a reason, you know, that cleans out your inside. You know, I always hear those fancy words today, like probiotics and uh, gut health, and th this is a uh, this is gut health 101 right here. So when you add this into the the water just before it boils, it actually causes the corn to puff up. And so a lot of y'all may be familiar with what's called hominy. Um, you know, like, uh, if you go to a Mexican restaurant, I think it's called pozole. Uh, this is kind of the same thing. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very similar uh, corn type, but uh, it, it's just prepared a little different. Hominy is not busted up. Hominy is like the whole kernels, and then they're puffed up inside the hole. This one, the holes have been burned off or have been broken off first. Now, uh, so then, so the big thing about soft key is it takes a long time. You're looking at, uh, you know, a few hours to cook and you're just looking for the kernels to become soft. And so <clears throat> this is what it would look like after it's done. So you got a nice little bit of yellow color there. And, um, you know, it resembles hominy a little bit, but it's, but it's, it's different. Now, the cool thing about Ozofki is that uh, it's eaten hot it's eating warm it's eating cold and the old folks even eat it uh let's call it kamoksi which is like after it sours you know <laughs> and that's kind of gross but uh some of those guys like it when it's got like a film after it's been sitting out for a few days but 
Um, this this dish was, is, you know, it looks very simple, but it fed, like I said before, it fed a lot of mouth. And um, one of the things, if you do some research about about the way the uh, the explorers interacted with the creeks, you always hear about their hospitality, even on into the early 1900s when an ethnologist named John Swan uh, visited Indian territory in the late 1800s. And he said that the women, you know, would have dirt floors, but they would split their last kernel of corn with you. And that line's always, always uh, stayed with me. But, you know, even if you, you could, you would find this dish a long time ago at any fireplace. Um, you know, we didn't really typically have like the three set meals that you have today, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so these pots of food would just stay, stay readily available for anybody that would come, that wanted to come. So any visitor that would come, you know, I, I kind of joke around about Southern hospitality was started by the Indians, but you know, it's really true because they fed travelers, they fed strangers. And even if you were an enemy, if they didn't want you in there, they would leave food tied up in the trees so that maybe you wouldn't come in. So, uh, and even today, that's part of our, that's a big uh, pillar of our, of our cultural values is to, um, you know, always be hospitable and feed and feed people. And in, in our ways, you know, you don't, uh, if somebody, if somebody offers you food, even if you just ate or even if you're full, you always just take a little bit. And uh, that's kind of our, a little bit about, uh, about traditional ways. Um, like I said, you know, this, the, what I hope that you all gain from this is a little bit of appreciation for some of the traditional ingredients and, and recipes that are still cooked uh, today. And, um, you know, we, we want uh, food. Food is a big part of our identity. And I uh, want to make sure that we educate the public on, you know, what, what you would find in Alabama four or 500 years ago, but also know that there are still people out there who are, you know, carrying these ways on. And so, you know, it's a lot of times, you know, people have a, a red solo cup and, uh, you know, they put a little bit of off key in there and, um, you know, they just take it, take a drink in a, in a, and you can kind of chew and drink at the same time. But, um, another thing with, with, with Ozofki that's kind of cool is that, uh, it was kind of like an energy food. And, you know, if you were traveling for a long time, you know, either on a, you know, hunting trip or traveling from tribal town to tribal town, all you had to do was, you know, just boil some water and put some lye and these dry kernels into a, into a pot and you had something to fill your belly. So that's kind of the basics of Warzofki. Um, you know, there's a lot more, a lot more to it, I guess, but uh, very simply put, that's kind of uh, the logistics of it. And hope Hope you uh, take the time to maybe um, try to flip my camera back around here. Hope you take the time to uh, learn how to do it at home. Well, awesome. Like, thanks for sharing that. I think that the process with the lie is really cool, too. Um, and it being a natural probiotic, I think that's that's really, <laughs> really awesome. Um, we actually do have a question. Sure. Let's see. This is from Mandy. She says, hi, Alex. I'm covering this event for my journalism assignment class. Do you mind explaining why it is important to educate non-native people about these recipes and aspects of this culture? Yeah, sure. You know, that's a great question, Mandy. Um, or Mandy, I'm sorry. So, you know, especially when you think about and in, in being indigenous in the 21st century, um, you know, everybody kind of assumes we all wear headdresses and live in teepees and, you know, sing and dance all the same ways. But, you know, just here in the United States alone, there's over 540 different different tribes. Now, if you go to Central America, you've got probably 40 or 50 different bodies. You still have uh, indigenous people in the Caribbean. South America and on into Canada too. There's there's a lot of different people, and so with with programs like this, I think it's it's so important, it's so vital to kind of understand the complexity of of Native American culture in the 21st century. You know, you know, and and I hate to say it, but you know, we've we've survived some of the worst um, that the that that uh, colonization has thrown. And, you know, we're, we're still here trying to carry on the best we can. Um, and so that's, you know, when, a, you know, I, I, as an as a educator myself full time, you know, I always teach my students about the real history of not only my people, but also other races as well. And, you know, I, I always tell them that I'm not trying to educate you 
uh, to to make you mad or upset. I'm, I'm educating you to empower you so that you can know how much your ancestors went through just so you could be mm-hmm. here today. And that's, you know, that's kind of my, I guess, in my roundabout way of answering your question. Awesome. Thank you. Is there any more questions? I'm going to wait a little bit, see if there's any more that'll pop up in the chat. So how did you learn how to pre- prepare soft key? Well, that, well, that's a, um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, being a, my, my, my grandfather was removed from our, our culture at a young age. And so, you know, we didn't really grow up um, learning this stuff, but at a, at a younger age myself, a young teenage years, I kind of decided that these things are important and the food's tied to our ceremonies. And so uh, our, our elder of our, of our tribe, of our, the, they call him uh, Hokti and Homata is like our, our woman leader of our ceremonial grounds. Her name was uh, Pauline Proctor. And uh, she, she taught me when I was probably about uh, in the early twenties, how to, how to make this dish correctly. Like her, like her folks had made it a long time ago. And um, you know, it, it looks simple, but <laughs> the first couple of times I made it, uh, you know, I always had stuff bo- boiling over and <laughs> had some of the kernels were still hard and, you know, <laughs> almost broke your teeth on it. So it took some time to get it right. But, um, you know, at our camp, you know, when we feed visitors, it's always cool to have people uh, who come up and ask where's, Hey, you got any softy? And, you know, uh, recently this past couple of years we've been able to say we sure do go, go get yourself some so it's made me feel good that you know people are uh, still enjoying it that's awesome i've actually had the fermented softy before and i'm gonna be one of those people who actually, actually like it oh, okay. <laughs> so All right. I'm, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in that group of people that, that like it so you got some uh, um, ancient ancient kampucha going on <laughs> yeah well, if there aren't any more questions in the chat, I guess this will conclude this portion of the Native American Festival. We hope you'll join us tomorrow for our 9 a.m., 11 a.m., 1 p.m., and 7 p.m. broadcast um, to purchase things from our festival gift shop. Please go to festival.museum.ua.edu to learn more about Moundville in general. Um, please visit moundville.museums.ua.edu. And thank you, Alex, so much for being with us today. And thank you for all the people who are watching with us live and those who are watching later in the future. So thanks for attending Virtual Festival. I hope you all have a great evening. Bye. To support Moundville Archaeological Park, please consider visiting festival.museums.ua.edu and clicking Support Moundville at the top of the page. Mm -hmm.